We are going to be talking about educating black and brown students. My name is George Guy, and you can read my bio a little bit later on. Without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our incredible panelists today that are going to be taking us through a series of questions on how we can better educate black and brown students. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Fatima Brunson. Fatima is a postdoctoral student or researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, her research interests focus on how school leadership and teachers' collaborative practice influences teachers' ability to enact anti-racist, culturally responsive practices. She is housed in the School of Education. Welcome, Fatima. Hi, everybody. And we also have with us DJ Sharif. DJ is the Senior Director of Curriculum and Instruction at Detroit 9090, supporting university prep schools, the largest public charter in Detroit, Michigan. She is committed to providing students both access and opportunity through rigorous, culturally responsive math teaching. Welcome, DJ. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's get into our questions. Excellent. So, scholars, since March of this year around the country, uh, many of us have been experiencing uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic um, in education with our black and brown students and our black and brown families. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with the advent of Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and on May 25th with George Floyd, we experienced a second pandemic of social mm -hmm. injustice and social unrest. Mm -hmm. How have both of these pandemics exacerbated educational disparities for both black and brown children? Yeah, so I, go first. What's been phenomenal about um, this pandemic is that it, it pushed the education sector in multiple ways, some for good, um, as well as exposing certain things. And then also understanding that the, the racial pandemic that existed um, just magnified, because it always was there, right? It, it just magnifies um, every few months um, due to um, an incident that outrages people and or amplifies the racism that exists in our country. When I think about our students, this is a unique opportunity for them to be at home, right? For the state of Michigan, we eliminated standardized testing we talked about how racist and anti black it is. And so there's been great opportunities in that. Um, there's been opportunities to ensure that our kids don't have to worry about transportation, um, that they can log on as long as we provide them the So there's been some wins in the district um, with the pandemic. It's very, very raw, raw with all the systems to the pandemic. Um, but there's definitely an opportunity to problem problems. As well. Someone, said, Someone it's said it's hard to hear. To hear. Me? So much, so DJ. much DJ. Getting feedback, feedback. So we're going to ask all our colleagues to mute themselves if they're not. Excellent. That's a little bit better. And we want to welcome Tony Clark to the panel. So, welcome, Tony. Once we um, get into the corpus of this question, I'll do an introduction for Tony. But we're gonna let Fatima talk about um, disparities that we've seen from the two pandemics, the COVID-19 pandemic and then the social injustice pandemic. Fatima, you have the floor. Yeah, so first I would like to echo what DJ is saying. Like much of this stuff is that uh, there are educational disparities and many of them were highlighted. Um, and we just sort of got to see, right, just as the world just had a time to just stop and sit and reflect. Um, we not only got to see the work of our government, um, but we also, I think, especially for parents, they got to, they got a, a special look um, into the curriculum. They got a special look into their interactions uh, between students and teachers. Um, and I think everybody, all of a sudden, were paying attention to schools in ways that um, We've always sort of paid attention to schools, but really we paid attention to test scores. And so now we started to pay attention what's happening on the inside of the building. So I agree with DJ, much of this stuff was really just highlighted. I um, mean, I think the exacerbation comes from just flat out the digital divide. Um, one of my colleagues called it the digital pandemic. 
Um, but really it's just the fact that there were schools, districts, parents, students, at every level of the ecosystem, there were disparities. So there were students who did not have the access to remote learning. And even if they did have the digital technology, they didn't have the knowledge they need for learning to ensue. The same for teachers. Teachers had certain technologies. They didn't have the knowledge they needed for remote learning to occur. And certain schools did not have the digital infrastructure for remote learning to occur. So I think that um, greater attention is, especially in STEM, greater attention Pay to the digital divide. We just think that overall, um, these things were exacerbated because of remote learning, but really just highlighted. Fatima, uh, first we'd like to take a moment to uh, introduce Tony Clark. Tony is the, and this is his abbreviated bio, so Tony, you can feel free to add in information that I may have missed. Tony currently serves as a tenured professor of English literature and learning communities at Bunker Hill Community uh, College in Boston. He's a proud graduate of uh, Cambridge Public Schools. Uh, Tony is also a volunteer member of the state task force committed to, committed to designing and instituting strategies and frameworks to raise the retention and graduation rates of males of color who attend community colleges. So Tony, welcome. The question is, how did the two pandemics, the medical pandemic that we've been experiencing since late February and early March, um, and the social injustice pandemic with Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, um, George Floyd, and many, many others, how have those two pandemics exacerbated disparities that we have seen in our schools with black and brown children? Welcome, Tony. Thank you. I've had some medical difficulties, but I'm glad to be with you. Um, I think um, and having the opportunity to listen to a number of things, um, is it Fatima, is that correct? That Fatima mentioned, I think she was she was spot on. Um, particularly, I currently sit on the state task force that's looking at reentry um, with, with respect to our K-12 schools here in the state of Massachusetts. And everything which, which Fatima had mentioned is, is so, so poignant in terms of where being it's, it's clear in terms of Massachusetts, it's no secret, it's a relatively white, white state. Um, but it's also Boston and specifically, you know, the greater Boston area in which where I'm from, it's very segregated, right? And so what we have seen specifically in the greater Boston region is that the, the points of demarcation around access and non-access, right? In terms of we have um, been having this conversation, there was COVID before, you know, COVID, particularly in our particular, our, our schools. Um, as we think about the city of Boston, Massachusetts as a whole, is one of the top four in venture capital. And when you look at some of the other places, California, Texas, um, and New York, they have been created with their venture capital partners around kind of, just to Fatima's point, looking at how do you drive the digital divide and making sure that we address some of the inequities that come around both hardware and also broadband. And I don't think we've done, uh, we, have, we haven't been as creative around those spaces, particularly as it relates to our blacker and browner communities. I think as well, we haven't utilized the opportunity to talk about, I mean, you know, a curriculum. Um, for example, one of our school districts that deems itself to be one of the more progressives, we're having a conversation where this is an opportunity to maybe indulge into the 1619 curriculum. You know, we're still at a standstill around, around that conversation when you would think that these were great entry points, particularly as you heard, you know, cosmetically, if it be Twitter or, or Facebook or even in terms of dialogue in the community. But when it came to driving those conversations down into uh, our schools, it was like, let's not talk about that in a really robust and articulated way. Uh, we have seen in some of our more suburban districts where folks have halted statewide testing and have been really adamant around the creativity around looking at um, work-based learning opportunities, um, uh, looking at in terms of how we look at report card and grading, whereas in our blacker, in uh, more marginalized communities, it's very rigid, and in some ways, become it's become more rigid around testing, and um, and we haven't addressed the fact that our our young people were struggling with, you know, looking at school as an as a place of uh, solace when they were in school, and we're having some conversations now where a number of our black and brown students, or families, I'd say, say my kid feels more, you know, more at peace with his or her education that they're not in school 
when, when they were in school. So, you know, there are a number of things, particularly when you think about the backdrop of Massachusetts, specifically um, in the Boston area and our are, are in different history around race. Um, this has been a fascinating um, moment, but I also think it, it's been a polarizing moment because it's called into question not only our K-12 structure, but the, you know, the individuals we have in running these schools in, our, in, in, in these respective buildings. Thank you so much, Thank you so much, Tony. We appreciate it. And we're gonna ask all of our panelists to make sure they're muted while they're not speaking. I think uh, polarization that Tony was speaking about and that Fatima and DJ also spoke about in terms of exacerbating disparities, this polarization, we have seen it since November 3rd, November 4th, November 5th, November 6th, and now November 7th, um, just a couple of hours ago, we were getting breathers and uh, many of us are rejoicing and celebrating around uh, the nation and around uh, the world. Uh, but our children, our black and brown children, have had to deal with that. They've had to deal with police brutality. They've had to deal with a number of other different aspects uh, that this pandemic um, brought about, exacerbated, and then uh, didn't, frankly, these things existed um, much before the pandemic. But where we are now, we are a divisive country, and we're looking for unification as Americans, but what does that mean for black and brown students in all of our schools? And what does that unification through this divisiveness uh, mean for black and brown families? Why don't we, Tony had the last word, so why don't we start with Tony and then we'll go to Fatima and then we'll end with DJ. And feel free to add in other information. That's a, that's a loaded question. I, you know, I think, you know, our sisters saved us. I was hoping that they would save me on this question and they would start, right? So um, one of the things which is fascinating for me is that you're right. You know, we, we have seen the last couple of days, the polarization, and particularly when you talk about or when there have been conversations around about Detroit or Philadelphia or Milwaukee or in some case Atlanta and in some cases Pittsburgh. What I have found most fascinating the fact that there has been an announcement, um, and I guess you know, the, you know, there will be, there is a new president-elect. However, as we we see with this, we're also seeing the backdrop of it, if or if it's, C, if, if it's CNN or if it's MSNBC, and they're really adamant about, well, the Democrats need to be really intentional about bringing in Republicans into the cabinet. The Democrats need to be really intentional about not making this a progressive, um, uh, you know, uh, cabinet, right? The Democrats need to be conscientious of the fact that while black voters were a prominent, you know, played a prominent role on um, that, it was the moderates of, you know, the last three or four campaigns that help, uh, you know, direct the ship. And I think when you say those things, and, you know, particularly more specifically, when you're looking at, you know, some of the communities in which I mentioned that, you have once again siphoned the genius of black people. And so now you have this, this interesting dichotomy where families are like, wow. I went out there, I sat in line, I, you know, I voted. I, in some cases, I held up signs. I was really a part of this particular process. And if you read through the lines, it's like, once again, I'm marginalized, right? So if they feel that way, that will then trickle down to our young people. I think that this is a pretty great opportunity to talk about civics, but I think at the same time, to make sure we are cognizant about the fact to not to become sleep, again, as we did when Obama won. I think we were so excited about the idea, the aspirational thought of a post-racial discussion or post-racial country. I think we need to have a conversation around very much as Trace, you know, Stacey Abrams did and other folks in Georgia that, you know, Joe Biden is not a change agent. He's a chess move. And we need to look at this opportunity as black folks and how do we play chess in this moment and not to be get ca caught up with the cosmetic theater that folks will want us to get caught up in this moment as when we and we know um, we're, we're often not the benefactors of this of this great party yeah thank you for that tony because that's that's exactly um where i'm going with this in terms of uh us not getting too comfortable um, I know it was probably a few years into Obama's election that I started to on purpose be critical about what's happening 
Um, especially because Obamacare, I think that kind of woke folks up like, okay, expansion. Um, but anyways, uh, so to speak to the question around what it sounds like, what polarization has to, uh, what really its effects is on our black and browner communities. Um, and one thing I was thinking about um, was just about overall consciousness. So um, just my own disposition, I try to be glass half full. Um, and so that was one thing is like not that not just Corona brought us, but Trump brought, bought us that sort of hyper consciousness and specifically for those who like sort of had a social justice orientation. So I do think this is the right time to talk about civics and political engagement and how do we continue the movement? You know, like how do we continue the progressive nature of it all? How do we uh, not get comfortable with this? Right. Because there's still so much work to be done. Um, and I think that specifically as it relates to education, there is an amazing opportunity for educators to engage this moment specifically as it relates to community education. What can we learn from our communities? And as we talk about culturally responsiveness and culturally sustaining pedagogies, we have to be talking about knowledge from communities and uh, and how to be creative with that, with our lessons, right? How do we bring technology into that? Because there are so many communities that could benefit um, from, uh, from the talents being directed towards their, their, their street, right? Like so much of the, our academic and intellectual knowledge is given and you give the assignment to the teacher. But there's a, a moment we have right now to make that assignment something to be done in the community. And I think that polarization is a huge factor in that, especially because now, you know, all the students are on social media. So they are being exposed to the opposition's perspective in ways that we were not. And so I think that it's just a um, we should take this time. We should take that polarization and try to drive it um, with our social justice mission. So Tony and Fatima had excellent points. It's hard to follow up on that. But I think the last thing that I want to say is that um, we've been doing the work and like today we celebrate, but yesterday we worked and tomorrow we will continue working on behalf of our kids. It has never stopped. And so Tomorrow begins, like, I'm so happy as a proud HBCU grad, Greek, all that. I'm so happy that our first uh, woman, our, the first vice president is a woman, but more importantly, she's a black woman, right? But tomorrow for Harris and Biden, the accountability um, begins think about this entire election cycle, K-12, particularly in education, has been very silent. We have not heard much about it, but knowing that our kids are our future and they're the most important um, individuals uh, like in our world, and we have not heard much about them. This is the time to push testing, right? Let's abolish it. This is the time to push curriculums and be, and I think Fatima and I were having the discussion prior to, like, this is a time to make the stamp that, like, we are anti-racist and, like, in districts, we are having the conversation. If you want to teach black kids, are you unapologetically committed to supporting them and also being on the journey to being anti-racist? And that's for like, even for our brown folks and our black and brown folks, making sure that we are not perpetuating a system that we are a product of because we have gotten all these accolades, but we've got it in a system of white supremacy to be co completely honest. And then the, the last thing with that is that our children are like struggling. Like our curriculum has to like live out in a way that celebrates them. And so we can't be so strict on the curriculum to meet test scores, but on a curriculum that's going to make sure that they are prepared um, for life after uh, high school and beyond. Thank you, Tony, Fatima, and DJ. Sharika, Sharika Ekpo, thank you so much for joining us. We are excited to have you. Just a brief note about Sharika before we ask her to answer the question everyone else is asking. She currently works for Google, but she is a innovator in terms of global diversity, equity, and inclusion. She has over 15 years of equity and inclusion leadership um, as it relates to strategic human capital consultation and operations. So welcome, Sharika. We are excited to have you, as I said. Uh, the last question was really around what has been happening since November 3rd that our black and brown children have been seeing. They've been seeing a lot of divisiveness and a lot of polarization. So what do we say 
to black and brown children in schools? What do we say to black and brown children's families about this divisiveness, this polarization, and the work that needs to be done? Welcome, Sharika, you have the floor. Thank you all so much. I am excited to be here with you today. Um, the past few days have been exhausting. And I am the mother of three children, one um, who's a graduating senior at Hampton University, and then a first grade, uh-oh. <laughs> But this is Howard all day, Howard all day. I just had to rep, no. Um, and a first grader and a preschooler who's in K-4. And my children are, my son comes back from his learning pod every day. And he says, mom, is the election over? Is the election over? Is the election, it, every day. He, he got up this morning and said, is the election over? And as I cooked breakfast, I said, no. But as we completed breakfast, I said, yes. And we celebrated. So it really, it is really, um, those moments that remind me that it is my job to educate, you know, my children about what's happening because I cannot allow or depend on our school systems to do it. They have failed us and will continue to fail us. I try to find resources that are um, at their level to explain some of the divisiveness and some of the racial um, injustices that are happening. And we start at the very basics of difference. Like, what is the difference between this person and that person? We all, and in my house, we celebrate Black culture. We celebrate our melanin. Um, and I, it's so funny, as I was thinking about preparing, as I was preparing for this, I started looking at resources that I use with my own children. And this is not about elections. This is not about, this is just about the basics. It's a kid's guide to racism. Because my seven-year-old is like, why don't people play with me? We're in the Bay Area. We hail from Washington, D.C. And so our environment is different. And so what I would say is, listen, while we need to have we have to continue to push for our curriculums to be expansive and comprehensive to tell the true stories of our ancestors. As parents, we also have our own responsibility to ensure that we provide the basic foundation education that they may or may not get in the classroom. So what I would say is um, we have to think about doing the research for ourselves because we know we've been through the education system. We know what the gaps are. So as parents, let's fill the gaps. So for me, with my little ones, I'm using this. And with my oldest daughter, you know, she's always like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. She's at an HBCU, but when she goes to her internships, she's one of the only. And so I have a good friend and sorority sister who wrote this book, Anti-Racist, Words of Change. And these inspirational words really start as a a starting point for how we open the dialogue, because the dialogue is what we need to do and what needs to happen in order to bring the community together. So Fatima talked about the community. Let's bring the community together. And, and oftentimes, some of the educators that are there don't address the subjects in a way uh, that they should because they can't. They don't know the truth. So if they don't know the truth, we have to tell them the truth. So anyway, I just try to find a number of different resources that um, empower me to make sure that my children understand what's happening, as well as sharing that with the broader community. Thank you for that perspective, Sharika. I think, uh, we are diving into an anti-racism theme, so I want to kind of stay in that area Let's talk about anti-racism in schools. We have charter schools represented, public schools represented, independent schools. There could be parents or loved ones who are homeschooling. Uh, so we need to talk about what anti-racism looks like in schools, not just action, but policy. And how do we begin to dismantle that? Uh, we have a real opportunity as it relates to some of our students being in person and some of our students, as Tony said, don't wanna come back because they are thriving. There's no after school detentions, there are no suspensions when we are on online learning. So what is it from an anti-racism policy perspective that we need to be implementing in all of our different types of schools or ways in which we educate students that can make a real impact for black and brown students? Let's start with Fatima. Uh, and then we'll go to DJ and then we'll, uh, Sharika already gave us a lot of great stuff and we'll end with Tony, all right? Absolutely. So the first thing that comes to mind is around having sort of policies um, that are going to ring true while we're in the building and while we're at home, 
in remote learning, um, especially because we're in the second wave, third wave, we in another wave of the coronavirus. And we probably will continue to see states and districts with their various ways of handling things, right? Um, you got, and right now I just want to think about public, but even thinking about though, like not everybody goes to public schools, there are charter schools, there are private schools, and we're just going to have very different policies across the board. So I'm thinking about anti-racist policies um, that are really going to uh, shape the institutional culture. Um, and so one of the areas of research that I focus on it, um, is around these formal mechanisms for learning and collaboration in an informal social structure. And the best thing that I have right now in terms of hardcore policies is around creating policies that say you need an intentional group of people who are going to think about equity issues, who are going to raise equity questions, and then they're going to change policies based on that data. So I would say that's the most formalized thing that you can do is sort of create your culturally responsive and sustaining teaching committee. And then the next thing I think that's going to actually get you to sustaining those policies is the informal social structure. The only thing that's going to work and going to work over time is people relating to one another, us doing this right here. If people don't like their boss, they are not going to do good work. Now, some people say, yes, you're in the classroom. You have your individual classroom. You can block all of that out. Not every day. Not every day. So we need to have policies that are going to help us change a sort of institutional culture. So, yeah, we can have that formal culturally responsive teaching committee. But how are we creating policies that help us relate to one another? Because so many of us, and I can imagine uh, folks in this room right now have to go back to their white colleagues, somebody who voted for Trump. And they got to sit in a Zoom meeting with them. And so when I think about like policies that are going to happen over time, it's really culture. It's the policies that are going to help us change our institutional culture. Fatima, when I think about policies, I know last year, and this is a shout out to my chief teaching um, and learning officer, Dr. Lewis, um, who brought us uh, together, um, leaders from all levels, teachers, deans, all levels brought us together. We read multiple texts, including Hammond. Um, we read Chris Emden, Dr. Emden. And what we had to do was look at our student code of conduct and what are we expecting from students? And like actually analyzing, like, why are we so gung ho on like uniform? We want we call them scholars and we want them to wear a uniform. And we we feel like if they wear a shirt and tie and slacks and black socks, that they're going to be scholarly and that's going to all of a sudden bring like smartness, right? No, our black children absolutely have everything within them to be successful. Our teachers are facilitators of learning, right? They're not pouring anything into our, our black children. It already exists, they're resilient, and they come from communities and families that unapologetically want them to succeed. So we had to ask ourselves like, why are we so pressed on <laughs> uniforms? Because it, it mirrors this prep private white school we had to exit, right? And then we had to think about in the virtual space, like, do we want them wearing uniforms? No, like let them bring them full selves. If they wanna wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, then that's what they wanna do. If that's what our teachers wanna wear, that's what they're gonna do. And I think that one by one, we're looking at policies that we thought, and we're coming from a charter, right? But I've been a principal in a public district. We, we come from a place where we want our kids to feel smart. No, they're already um, smart. So, and, and sometimes it's hard to go to a board and go to a superintendent, shout out to my superintendent, she's a black woman, but like to go to those stakeholders and say, like this entire thing is racist. We, we, we got to cut it off. We got to go to the charter authorizers and say like, this is racist. And it actually is like, it, it, it works against our, our students. But then also pushing privileged districts, um, all white districts, like they're not the only, they need black teachers. They need anti-racist work because um, we are going to prep our kids to be able to navigate this world. And they're going to come against white folks who have not done the work either. And they're going to be confused, like what is going on? So our kids need the work, but the privileged white districts need black teachers. They need anti-racist work um, too, and policies in their districts as well. Well said, DJ Sharif. <laughs> I, I agree and concur 1000%. Um, as an HR professional, I'm all about training and hiring policies that really ensure that we have the right teachers for our students. Um, too often, we just find people to fill the seats 
the voids. We know that in the black and brown communities, our students have more substitutes than full time uh, qualified teachers. And so for me, it's about the screening process. Everybody is not equipped to be a teacher. Right. So when you're thinking about hiring and you're training a teacher, I want to know, um, does the educator see themselves as just an educator or an educator ad, uh, ad activist? Right. Uh, do they know black history or do they know history? Let me start with that. Do they know the real history, not just black history, but black pedagogy? In other words, can they connect the fight for educational justice with racial justice? Right. Like we have to teach our students exactly what the truth is. And the fact of the matter is we can't do that unless we hire and train the right people. Finally, I would say um, screening and interviewing and coaching, I've been recruiting for years. That's not an easy job. Everybody thinks it is, but it's not. Um, so in the event that you have educators in the system uh, who don't have the skills that we need, then get them a coach. It is okay. Find them a coach. We need to ensure that we support policies and, and trainings that will help not only the teachers, but our students. Okay. Can you hear me? I was saying it's not often a Morehouse man is left speechless. I'm I'm kind of I don't have much to say after all these brilliant pieces, but I, I'm actually fascinated with Sharika, particularly as an HR professional. One of the things that I have found most fascinating around this um I like to call it infusion or, or cosmetic infusion of these conversations around anti-racism, and one of the things that I have found I was re reading an essay a couple of days ago, and they quoted um, Dr. Angela Davis on her thoughts around these new offices, and it was quite fascinating, particularly around, are these things for the institution or is it for a small group of people to feel comfortable around, right? And when I think about HR departments that I've, that I've been hired by, I mean, I worked for many years as, a, as an educator in New York City Public Schools, was that I don't remember going through a robust process of going, you know, kind of being hired, being onboarded, um, you know, helping, you know, knowing how to check in if something I felt something was going awry. And so now you're asking me to take on this yeoman's task of addressing race, racism, when in fact the, the district or in some cases the school hasn't defined what racism and anti-racism is to that school and how they are going to kind of peel it back and break it down and, and decipher it and explain it not only to students, but to families and other caregivers. So I think we have to be able to kind of peel back before we even delve into the intellectual side of anti-racism and make it more pragmatic. How do you work with the bodega, you know, the guy who owns the bodega when he talks to our black and brown students one way, but he talks to the private school kids on the other side of the street a very different way and help coaching him and around those practices. You know, how do we talk to parents around in terms of not being afraid to have those tough conversations, possibly with ourselves and our colleagues, and you know, what they believe to be some areas um, where they feel as though their student or young person has been harmed. And I think we have to call it out. You know, how do, how do we coach each other around these practices? Because at the end of the day, you know, I am still growing in a lot of these spaces, right? Um, I'm still trying to navigate, I know it was mentioned, you know, um, I know I have Trump supporters on those Zoom calls, right? And, and so I'm still trying to learn how do I practice that work while at the same time trying to understand why my, my sister is telling me that my niece was read a book uh, through her Zoom class about how this was a good time for black people because they're no longer in slavery and, um, you know, black people can vote. And, like, that's not an aspire, you know, that's not a great thing to hear, You're, you know, for an eight-year-old. But the person on the other side reading that book really believes that's a good thing. So there's so many things that I'm really fascinated, particularly about, particularly as it relates to the role in which Sharika has from an HR perspective. Who's looking at these resumes? What questions are being asked? Who, what families or other caregivers are in these interview committees, right? How are they being coached? So, um, and I think it was, uh, for, you know, uh, Fatima had said it and DJ both said it creating some uniform policies and not being afraid to say these are uniformed and we're going to see them through. And I know that at least where, where I sit, 
a lot of times, and I'll end here, when something doesn't work, they just go to something else. Let's try to vet it. Let's try to figure it out. Let's try to push on it and, and see where we can go with it. Thank you all. Very insightful, powerful comments. I think we're still in the theme of anti-racism. We've talked a lot about uh, coaching. We've talked a lot about anti-racism and culturally sustaining pedagogies. We've talked a great deal about policy and procedure and even vetting our own um, policies and procedures that may be racist. In fact, we've talked about community partnerships and how we deal with anti-racism there. But there are many people that may be in this session that are educators themselves on the front lines and they are uh, espousing the 1619 project which, which was mentioned. They are espousing Black Lives Matter curriculum in their work. Uh, and they are getting pushback from their colleagues, they're getting pushback from their administrators, they're getting pushback from their boards uh, and their central office folk, and they're getting pushback from their community. Uh, how do we speak to them? How do we speak to them about a safe space? Uh, because uh, I know for a fact that on November the 4th, I checked in with all of my uh, certificated and non-certificated staff of color just to see how they were dealing with racial battle fatigue just from the election. So are we doing that? Is that normative? Are there processes and protocols in place for um, educators to be able to do those things? Do allies know and accomplices, and Dr. Uh, Bettina Love will say co-conspirators, do they know to go and ask those questions? Are you okay? Are you, uh, uh, how are we putting those things into place? So let's expand upon that. I think we started that conversation. So whoever would like to jump in at this time, I'm not gonna assign any. Um, I could go. So as a district network leader and I manage curriculum and instruction for our entire district, I think what's important is that like our principals and our teachers have to know, like you have to do what's best in the name of kids. And that's very tough, uncomfortable work. And um, we come from a black district where our you know, superintendents and chiefs are black, um, but I also know coming from a experience where they weren't, right? And when you do what's best for kids, kids are gonna ride for you. And when you have kids rallying behind you, you have to understand like you have to address their social emotional, but you also have to push the academic rigor, right? It doesn't mean like, it's not a one, it's not a one or, it's, a, it's like a yes and, like, love them, like hype them up, gas them up, but make sure, you know, they are, are prepared um, to compete, right? And I'm not even talking about competing against white people, but being able to be successful and provide for themselves and the people that they love. And when you do that, you're going to you're gonna show growth, right? It's, and that's why I don't believe in standardized testing. So that's without a doubt, but it's like making sure that our kids are growing. And so and people can't argue with that. They can't argue with like, they're doing the things that they're they're supposed to do. And for me, when I think about math, all I look at is, and, and I'm supposed to like push a certain curriculum. You can make pivots to the curriculum if you need to, right? Don't, don't take equestrian out of the curriculum, give them access and opportunity to understand what that means. Embed basketball if you want to, that's fine, but don't delete things that's gonna give them access to navigate, you know, this world uh, that we live in, because I think that's that's, that's really important. But then also like when I come into classrooms, I want to hear kids talking. You you got your degrees, you got your certification, you did whatever you needed to do. Like I want to hear the voices of our students. I want them to have conversations with one another, right? Allow them to be advocates. Like a, Because when a teacher does that, they truly believe and respect the voices of our students, the families and the communities that they come from, the learnings that they've experienced within their home, because that education is just as important as this traditional. Um, those, those are my thoughts on <laughs> curriculum and such. Do what you got to do, teachers. Principals, do what you got to do. Like, just do what you got to do. So I'll speak next. Uh, I I like the idea of do what you got to do because that would the last word I just wrote on my page here of notes is negotiation, and so I was thinking about the fact that like right there's this inherent um, 
work, there's this inherent disruption that you need to engage in if you want to call yourself or engage in anti-racist cultural responsiveness. And so my original idea is, you know, galvanize, you know, it's, 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 if it's you, it could be some leader, some people on your team. So I study teaching teams and I'm really interested in how teachers work together in order to become anti-racist. And I know that the, some of those teams are formal. Everybody on the math team says, hey, we're going to read why are all the white kids sitting together in, or why are the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? You know, they're going to read that book. It could be informal. You know, some people that you and your girlfriends that are all teachers, you know, whatever, and you guys get together. That's that's always my uh, go to just because of the emotional drain. Right. Like I absolutely love my job. I love being here talking today. Right. I, lo I love doing my research. And what makes it so great is that I'm collaborating with so many people. And when I get tired, you know, there's somebody to say like, no, you got this. No, the work is necessary, you know, or rest Fatima. We got it for the rest of the night. And so as I think about like what this work does to, to our to our bodies. Right. Like literally I was telling DJ before this, the um, call started is that my, my stomach was in knots. You know, and it's in knots, not only just because there's an election going on, but I'm heavily engaged in this. Like, you know, I have to look up and be like, oh, there's a swimming pool. You know, let me go swim. But at the end of the day, this work is going to be emotionally draining. And so I think about I return to that word negotiation. And I think about the ways that educators must negotiate. Right. Like we're thinking like Sharika and you'll speak to like the hiring aspect of it. But like people don't want to get into it with their bosses. And then if your boss is at the district level, you know, like that's a that's a real we need to talk think about deeply the real realities of opposing, especially when we think about teachers from marginalized communities, teachers who feel like they need their job, teachers who don't want to lose their job. And equity and justice is still as important, but they must put food on the table. So I think that all of those questions, I don't have many answers for them, but all those questions deserve our attention and it, they can get our attention with our commitment to it. Um, so I think that overall, it's an inevitable opposition and we got to think deeper about um, for today and tomorrow, how are we going to support educators in negotiating that opposition? I don't have much to add. These two ladies have really <laughs> um, plus one. I agree, uh, Fatima, with everything that you just said, um, particularly particularly around the point. Um, about saving your job, right? Um, what I have seen happen as a parent, I've seen administrators and teachers kind of congregate and build a sense of community outside of the classroom. So right after school programs, you know, any anything um, that will get the children to really understand this anti-racist culture and, and what we do to, to combat it, but it's not done in the classroom because there's fear of retaliation, right? And so when you think about that, um, it's them taking, again, extra time outside of the classroom to kind of pull this group together one, two, three days a week to ensure that there is a community that can support our students in the way that they need to be supported. So it is exhausting. And when I think about um, what we, HR, parents, community members need to be doing, it is really making sure that um, that there are some resources around this secondary traumatic stress um, that our teachers are experiencing every single day. As a diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist, <laughs> strategist, uh, speaker, I experience this, this stress every single day. Every time I hear um, about someone's experiences, and it, it puts me in an, an emotional state where I am triggered, right? And so that trigger um, really drains me as a person. And I, I, I experience compassion fatigue, right? And there are times where our teachers are going through the exact same thing. And so what I would say is we need to bolster and support our teachers and find ways to build them up in a way so that they can fill their cup and it then overflows to our children. I'll be really brief. Actually, I'm fascinated um, by some of, some of the comments, and I just wanted to kind of speak to those. Um, for 12 years, I was actually a New York City public school teacher, and I felt that what I, I thought what I was doing was right. But as I'm listening to this conversation, it was probably off. So I would close my door and kind of live in my world and say, you know what, this is my space. I'm going to be do all the culturally responsive teaching um, that I want to do. And uh, George started off this segment and mentioned Patina Love. 
And I think in her work, um, which I think, which is so you know important, but particularly the idea of being an abolitionist, but not just being an abolitionist of one, being, you know, kind of helping, you know, corral others. So what you're seeing in places um, like Boston and, and Cleveland and, and Chicago, where you're seeing younger teachers or folks who are kind of uh, maybe five, seven years in the profession are making space to create community. And in the midst of this community, I mean, I know in Boston it's called the Teacher's Lounge. I think in Oakland they're doing some similar work with some some teachers, and they're essentially, how can we look at culturally responsive teaching? And maybe that's not going to happen in their respective schools, but they're also driving on districts. So when I saw one of the comments around, you know, uh, look, the district is predominantly, you know, the young person, the child has never seen a black teacher, obviously that breaks your heart. But these are opportunities where educators can then, I think, uh, can move on to the, di- can push on the districts, can push on. We're seeing in COVID um, educators and parents who are a lot more um, intentive and, and intentional around working and, and challenging school school committees and school boards. So I think this is an opportunity to also, when you're challenging those school boards and those school committees, however uh, the semantics are in your community, acknowledge that those educators who are doing the really great work of kind of bringing, you know, uh, themselves into the classroom or bringing uh, our stories um, throughout the school building. And I think well, that will then will push, um, will help our, you know, our HR professionals like Sharika make a case to bring in more, more people who are innovative, more people who are a little creative. Um, we will push on district a little bit more. So uh, I do think one of the things that I did really that was kind of not the best was I operated in a silo. And just made made the decision that you don't want to work with me, so I would close my door. When in essence, I'm really um, excited about the fact that a lot of these folks are opening up their doors and they're working across districts, but also across charter and private and public. They're not essentially just saying, "I work at a, a public school, I can't talk to you because you're a charter school." They're saying, "Where is good pedagogy at?" And let's get together. Wow, Thank you all great, great. Our last question, and we're going to limit you to 30 seconds or less, and it's it's tough, but I know you can do it because you're all incredible. I'm going to give you a quote, and it's by one of my favorite womanist, feminist authors, Audre Lorde. It says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Given that America's education system was initially created to educate rich white males, is the system something you truly believe can be fixed to educate our black and brown children? Or should we, for lack of better terms, be looking to burn it down and rebuild it back up? 30 seconds or more, we'll start with Dr. Right, reform versus revolution. And reform is my job, right? That's my job. Um, My personal stance is reform until we can revolt. Reform until we can revolt, period and point blank. It does have to be dismantled, but we must do it strategically. And I think that the work of everybody who's in our generation, our job is to disrupt and dismantle. And it will be the next generation's job to rebuild. Um, But I think really that's all anti-racist pedagogy is, is we are trying to disrupt and dismantle. I would say burn it down um, and have a blueprint of what the infrastructure is going to look like. Because it's not enough to burn it down and then look like what's going to happen now, right? It's like, burn it down, but let's have a blueprint and an infrastructure of what it needs to look like. But more importantly, burn it down. I I agree. Um, And as a parent, though, I'm like, I know it's difficult to build a plane while you're flying. I know it is. But we got to find a way to reform, supplement, right, and recreate. And um, the real question is how. So I think we have to get the right thought leaders in the room to create that blueprint 
that that DJ just talk, talked about. We need to we need to actually strategize because I think so often we have this emotional response to every to all of these external factors um, and the history that we just we just literally just try to keep our head above water, but we actually have to strategize. So supplement and recreate. Everything that they said, um, I love that, you know, DJ said, burn it down, I'm with her. Um, burn it down pragmatically while preparing our successors. Tremendous work, folks. Thank you so much. We are now into our Q&A um, session. We do have one question that I wanna start off with. Uh, how do you all feel about black parents homeschooling because they do not trust the school system? Should we even place our kids in a system that was never designed for them in the first place? Which is a great segue from what you all just talked about. And with, that's not a plant, that person came up with that automatically planning. So how do you feel about Black parents uh, homeschooling? And should we be placing our kids in a system that was never designed for them in the first place? Uh, Tony, why don't you start us? Stump me. Um, <laughs> that's a tough one, because one thing I've learned, you know, I have an eight-year-old, we have an eight-year-old, and I've learned that in the fact that I'm able to navigate um, his world, um, obviously, with the boss, who's the wife, right, is that I have a space of privilege that other folks, my family, maybe some of his classmates, you know, don't have, right? So I'm able to kind of navigate these spaces to look at that, to kind of look at that question of, you know, is this better for us, right? Um, and so I can understand the sentiment, and I and I actually feel it at times, Um I just want to make sure we build the infrastructure um, as we have that. I, and when Sharika had mentioned, you know, her, her child in, in the pod, I think we've been doing that as a community for years, right? You know, we've been creating that level of community for years. And I think we have to be very intentional around um, if Dr. Brunson's our, you know, our, our literacy specialist, you know, why can't I bring my child there? You know, um, you know, if DJ is doing the math and, 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 and how can, you know, Sharika, how can we utilize her HR skills to help coach us around navigating the school district, right, in, in a very strategic and a pragmatic way? Because if we're homeschooling, there are still resources from the district, respected district, that should be driven to us to help us with this process. So um, I think that we should look at it seriously, but I think we also should be vulnerable to ask for coaches and to be trained. Um, and to ask the tough questions, not only of ourselves, um, but of the folks in our community who, are, if it's at church or if it's some, or if it's online, will we'll tell you that they're all about the community. Now it's kind of put pressure on all of us um, to do better in that space. Thank you, Tony. Can we go DJ Fatima? And then for only we want to give Sharika some thought about this so that she can end us off as a parent since she started so strongly with a lot of the thoughts around parents. So DJ and Fatima, you have. Yeah, briefly, I, I agree with many of the sentiments that Tony said. I think that it just depends. I think the question came from Brittany. It just depends on like your access and opportunity. Like everyone does not have that opportunity. And that comes from a, a place of privilege to keep your child at home and educate them. But we know that education also is a uh, home is a part of the education system. It's not unique to the traditional um, system. So yes, if you have the ability to do that, then, then absolutely do it. Right. I also think about our folks that don't have the opportunity opportunity want to, and they know that they're sending their kids to a system that's like problematic. But that is why more than anything, like thinking about the HR systems and things of that sort, if we put like-minded people in place, we will begin to see a system where we, we believe that our children will be safe and will be able to like flourish and grow. I agree completely with what DJ said. Um, I was gonna say it's context dependent. I was actually thinking about those of us, right? Especially I'm in education. Uh, I, ju I just graduated uh, in March with my PhD. And so there are so many, thank you. There are so many of us who end up in, you know, Milwaukee, uh, 
There are so many of us that end up in Nevada. There are so many of us that end up in these rural places. And I actually was thinking about the people who need to send their kids to homeschool, like the people who cannot afford to send their kid to a space and have their kids identity totally disrupted and dismantled. So I was actually thinking about those. Like we have people of color who are spread out and who are not safe. They're in the middle of Trump territory. And so I'm thinking about how can we sort of build the online infrastructure so that actually we're making, you know, how we said, like so many parents cannot have their kids homeschool. They don't have the schedule. I'm thinking about how can we be creative about letting those parents who feel like I can't send my kid to that school. How can we make that a real possibility for them? Because there are so many places where you grow up and you just know you can't send your kids to that district and how devastating for that parent to feel like that's all I have. So I think it's completely important for us to start thinking about online infrastructures. Man, I think about um, how COVID has disrupted the way we learn, but then also think about the opportunities that it is now presenting um, in terms of this online infrastructure that didn't exist. Um, my brother and sister-in-law, five children, they're homeschooled. And it is a direct result of COVID, okay? Like there were some other things that played into that, but um, my sister-in-law said, nope, no more. And I will keep my children home and I will do this on my own. And so I do think it's context dependent. I do think that technology is creating an opportunity for us to be in community with one another, even if we're distant um, and geographically dispersed. Uh, I just think we need the resources. Um, some people don't know how. I know and grew up with plenty of people whose parents pulled together their last dimes to send their children to private school education because the school district where they lived was just inadequate and did not provide the support that black and brown children needed. Right. So I think we just this is a question that, you know, we had some great answers, but I do think it's context dependent. And I think that we should leverage technology in a way that will create the community that we need to support our children, whether it's in the classroom or at home. Thank you so much. So we have three more minutes. We have time for, I would say 30 to 45 second wrap up. Why don't we, uh, anyone can jump in at any point to give us some closing thoughts about the things that have been said and where we need to go and what um, the folks that are on the line need to be thinking about when school is back in session on Monday, whether they're homeschooling, whether they're in independent schools, whether they're in charter schools, whether they're in traditional pre-K to 12 schools. What should they be thinking about? Why don't we start off with Dr. Brunson? Give us something to think about as we go. We should be thinking about how to remain present. There is such an incredible opportunity presented to us. And I believe that the only way we can get to the next step is by really paying attention to this one. And so I think as parents start thinking about what you need to really help your, your child be successful. I think the same about educational leaders. What can we really do to help teachers be successful? Um, and so really, let, let's remain present. Let's remain present. I mean, Donald Trump is still trying to trying to hold on to the office. So we got to, you know, really uh, stand our ground. You know what I'm saying? We got to really keep on paying attention and rest so we can do it the next day. I think um, we just need to just continue to be in community. And, 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 and kids, like a life, life kit, right? right. Um, um, and I think we should have, have something, something in the future. There's a really, there's a really bad, 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 bad Can you all, Can hear, you all it? hear it? Okay. Um, create a life kit that has support for everyone. Um, and it should include, I mean, y'all, I got all sorts of coloring books for my babies, crayons. I mean, I, I got it all, right? But, but the point is, I think we need to ensure that we have kits and resources for all stakeholders. And so when I think about my principals, they need a different community. When I think about my instructional specialists and my teachers and my counselors and my parents and our community members, we, we really just need to meet people where they are. 
And so just pull together the resources and share. Um, I think the message that I have for parents and educators is that parents, you know, um, you birthed your children. You want the absolute best for them. You know what's good for them. Um, hold the stakeholders accountable, even if they look like you. And I think that's really tough, but we have to own that. Folks that look like us, even myself, I grew up in a, a system that was anti-Black. So there may be some mishaps. Hold me accountable right? And let me learn and understand that I'm also on a journey and other stakeholders that look like us are also on a journey. And for teachers, like, you know, you are the most important individual um, in, in the schoolhouse when we think of the lives of our, our children um, during school hours. Um, so we, we need you. We need you. We trust you. We believe in you. And you have to speak up just how we want our parents to speak up. You have to speak up of course, it has to be, you know, that balance of like still being safe, but take um, very calculated risks to move the work forward. Everything was said. I just think um, I would add that we just have to remain curious and just kind of take advantage and of the opportunity and just continue to be curious about what could be next. What can we do more of? Thank you all. Special thanks to Sharika Ekpo, Tony Clark, DJ Sharif, and Dr. Fatima Brunson for their work as being thought leaders and anti-racist activists today. I'm George Guy. We thank you so much for signing off and for joining in with Hidden Figures, educating Black and Brown students. We wish you well throughout the rest of the conference, and we wish you well throughout the rest of this day and your weekend. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, George. Thank you, Dr. Brunson. Congratulations. Thank Thanks. you, DJ. Congredible work. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to see what you guys do. Thank you, Sharika. Oh, thank Three you. hour time span. That's different. So my goodness, you're going to get it all together with those kids and everything else. <laughs> I can only imagine. Stay down there hollering now. I'm like, go watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was great. Thank you all so much for having me. It was amazing. Thank it was you. Incredible. It was incredible. And we, want to, we want to thank our friend Robin Jackson behind the uh, scenes there just doing some great work. So, Robin, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Or Robin Douglas. Robin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. You all have a great weekend. All, all right. right. You do. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>